everyone. So uh, we can get started now. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And the COVID-19 pandemic has been raging on for uh, the better part of a year now. And while recent announcements point to a vaccine coming out soon, there isn't really a clear end in sight yet. And pretty much every part of our society has been impacted by the pandemic, from our day-to-day -day lives to all of our political processes. And all of these changes have come under a lot of scrutiny over the past uh, couple months. But a subject that hasn't really been explored as significantly is the effect of the pandemic on peace building. And given the importance of peace building initiatives, um, not completely understanding the effect the pandemic is having on them can have pretty dramatic consequences. So here to speak on the effects of COVID-19 on peace building in Nigeria, Allies is grateful and honored to host Allies alumni, Ms. Britt Sloan, an independent consultant on conflict resolution and peace building, and her former colleague, Ms. Sharon Obogu, a program officer with the Marine Corps. So if either of you would like to get started. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here and rejoin the Allies family and IGL family. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed my experience and hope all of you, despite the distance, are still finding ways to build those bridges and transcend those borders. So um, thank you so much for, for having us. Um, and uh, as Nitya mentioned, uh, I am a former program manager with, with Mercy Corps in Northeast Nigeria. Uh, I'm currently an independent peace building and conflict management consultant based in Erbil. So it is very much evening here. Um, and uh, I'd like to give Sharon the floor to introduce herself for, for just a moment as well before we turn to the slides. All right, hi everyone. My name is Sharon Ubogu. I am the program officer for the Northeast Conflict Management and Stabilization. I work for Mexico and focusing in the Northeastern states of Nigeria, precisely Borno states. So I'm excited to be here to speak on the topic peace building in a pandemic. Excellent. Thanks so much. And uh, we can flip to the first slide. Um, so as uh, Nitya so rightly said, over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected nearly every country and territory on the globe. And while the virus may not be able to distinguish between people of different nationalities, ethnicities, ages, genders, political stripes, the way that the pandemic interacts with different societies is indeed different. And that relationship is particularly fraught in contexts that are affected by violence and instability due to some of the underlying root causes of that fragility. And so my former colleagues at Mercy Corps, Lisa Inks and Adam Lichtenheld, developed this model that you see here to map out some of those relationships, demonstrating not only how COVID affects peace, um, but also how violence and instability affect COVID. Um, and when we're talking about COVID-19, we mean not just the virus, but also some of the containment and mitigation measures that governments, states around the world put into place can actually reinforce uh, violence and instability. And so I'll just briefly present the five different pathways that we see here, and then we'll explore them a little bit more in depth within the specific case study of Northeast Nigeria. So my colleagues, Lisa and Adam had posited that um, COVID-19 and those containment measures can have a, a negative effect on proliferation of dis and misinformation, increasing scarcity and economic uh, competition, fraying social cohesion, and uh, enabling armed groups to fill the void. And the one that we're going to focus on in particular today 
is the deteriorating, how COVID can contribute to deteriorating state society relations. Um, in particular, limited, the limited legitimacy of government um, and limited capacity of government to fulfill their duties, um, the exclusion and marginalization of in particular minority groups within a society and the weak civic engagement of the, many of those same groups in a participatory governance process. And so while there is an impulse among some donors and policy communities to shift funding towards public health interventions, this comes at the expense of peace building and governance. And in a complex world, these seemingly distinct sectors are intrinsically linked. And so social divisions and broken social com contracts actually impede the effective implementation of public health responses, um, just as the pandemic and botched uh, mitigation measures and responses to the pandemic can actually undermine long-term efforts for peace and good governance and, and stability. And so there's really an imperative here to continue seeing those linkages, understand the complexities and, and that holistic analysis of the problem, as well as to recognize the opportunities to strengthen the resilience of fragile societies in these contexts. So we can move now to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, as some of you may be aware, um, Northeast Nigeria has been at the epicenter of a brutal conflict since 2009, when the two groups, uh, well, one group, um, mostly known as Boko Haram, but formally, for, formally known as Jama'a Ahal um, Asuna Lidawa Wal uh, Jihad, um, came and uh, rose up and started a, a violent uprising. And then subsequently, um, there was a splinter group as well, the Islamic State West African province um, that split in 2016. These groups and a number of uh, smaller splinter groups have affected the entire Lake Chad Basin region, um, including not just Nigeria, but also its neighboring countries of Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. Um, but the epicenter remains Borno State um, in, in Northeast Nigeria. And in the past decade, we've witnessed that 36,000 people have been killed 1.1 million people have been displaced and 1.2 million have remained cut off from humanitarian assistance. Um, and it is important to note that uh, obviously while this violence is, is horrific, um, these groups uh, collectively known as, as Boko Haram did prey on real grievances that were pre-existing. Um, there have been in Borno uh, since before 2009, long-standing governance grievances around corruption, poor service provision by the government, regionalism, both in terms of how resources are allocated from Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, to Borno, but also within Borno from the state capital of Maiduguri to different local government areas. Um, in how the north, central, and south parts of Borno have been prioritized for political power. Um, this also extends to a sense of political protectionism within uh, the way that that government is set up. There are also pre-existing socio-cultural conflicts and divisions, including inter-ethnic divisions between the majority Kunuri tribe and other minority tribes um, throughout um, the state, including Shua, Margi, um, and different uh, smaller tribes throughout the state, intergenerational conflict that we often see between traditional elders and, and youth in their society, some interreligious conflict between Christians and Muslims, although it is important to note that 
the root of the conflict isn't really a religious one in the same way that we see it in other parts of Nigeria, um, as well as uh, quite severe marginalization of women in, in all public spaces. So those all, those set of conditions pre-existed, uh, were pre-existing, but since the, the violence started, you've now seen a new set of dynamics that have both reinforced those pre-existing dynamics and introduced new effects. Uh, you've seen a, quite a severe militarization of the response at the expense of other um, interventions that really address these root causes of the crisis. Uh, an interest in using military as the primary tool to address the, the crisis and not really looking at these other governance grievances and, and social, uh, socio-cultural conflicts um, and, and really looking at the institutional reform that's often in some ways much more difficult than a, a pure military response. Uh, you've also seen since 2015 in particular, um, the uh, introduction of, of, the, of international humanitarian aid. It's important to note that there were a, a network, there was a network of local organizations that were providing humanitarian assistance before then, but you saw a huge investment after 2015 until now um, for the international um, humanitarian uh, organizations coming in and providing emergency life-saving assistance to people. Um, however, there's been quite a severe politicization of that aid, both in terms of the government trying to at times co-opt that, that aid um, and use it for their own purposes, um, and as well as um, quite, a, quite a tense relationship with the humanitarian community and also understanding how these humanitarian assistance modalities can sometimes actually undermine um, those interventions to uh, invest in those longer term reform processes that the government itself is responsible for. And then you have these dynamics of displacement. As we said, you have 1.8 million people displaced, which has not only eroded uh, people's livelihoods, people's ability to get education, their ability to access systems of government and basic services, but it's also only in further deepened uh, their trauma that they might have experienced as a result of the initial violence and eroded these social, uh, these traditional conflict management mechanisms that were in place uh, as you have IDP, internally displaced persons, uh, now settling in host communities that haven't historically interacted. So we can go to the next slide now. So now I want to talk about some of those uh, different pathways that you saw on that first slide, um, but looking specifically at the case study of Northeast Nigeria. So starting with these state society relationships um, in, and really looking at the collapse of, of the social contract, in Northeast Nigeria we see, as we said, uh, quite a significant uh, lack of legitimacy of the government. On the first day that it was announced that COVID had, had reached Nigeria, I remember being in the car with a taxi driver and asking if he believed that COVID was indeed in Nigeria. Um, it, the first case was in Lagos and, and he said, absolutely not. I don't believe that it's here. I believe that it's just the government creating this story so that they can get more humanitarian assistance from the international community and just take that money for themselves. So there is an inherent lack of trust in the government and suspicion that any good things that come from outside are just co-opted by the government. There's also this sense of a double standard. Um, in the first month of the lockdown in, in Borno in April, um, we saw that uh, the lockdown was being applied as people liked, as the government saw fit for themselves. You had a crackdown on religious leaders who were trying to carry out 
uh, Friday prayers, but government officials were allowed to move around the, the city as they liked. Um, so that further erodes the credibility of both the government as well as the mitigation measures uh, around COVID. Um, as mentioned, you have poor access of, of citizens to the levers of government. Um, since the insecurity started in, um, in 2009, we've seen a huge flight of local government officials from local communities to the capital of Maiduguri. Um, this is in some cases because uh, traditional leaders in particular and, and, and government officials were the primary ones being targeted by, um, by Boko Haram and armed opposition groups. And so they were very fearful to return, but that has left this very physical gap um, between communities at the grassroots and the individuals that are supposed to represent them, both the, the state uh, and local government officials, as well as traditional authorities in some cases. Um, so that makes it incredibly difficult for citizens to understand why these measures are lockdown measures, containment measures are being put into place, and to also voice their concerns, their needs, give government an understanding of, of how these measures are affecting them. Uh, also very tangibly, we've seen that the uh, we've seen an effect on, on local government as well. We had initially, there were initially local government elections that were planned for June of this year, um, which would have been the first since the, uh, the crisis started. Up until now, you've had local government officials that have been appointed rather than elected, which again means that that sense of real representation is missing at the local level. And because of COVID, we've now seen that the elections has, have been postponed until we don't know when. Um, lastly, in terms of these, these governance challenges and the interaction with COVID, we've seen this politicization and mismanagement of palliative support from the government. Often this support is insufficient in quantity. It only makes its way to, um, to several families or several hundred families, which is, is wildly insufficient. Uh, there have been reports of some of the stocks being infested with, with weevils and insects being rotten. Um, and then we have this issue again of politicization, not only of the broader aid sector, but even of the assistance that's being delivered by the government, that they often give this assistance only to their own political party loyalists rather than, to, rather than on the basis of need. And we can move to the next slide. And so we mentioned that in the context of the crisis, we've seen this militarization of uh, the response. Um, and this is a bit challenging because I, I, I want to make clear that a lot of these dynamics were pre-existing COVID, but again, COVID has exacerbated some of them. So since the um, since COVID started, you've seen that armed opposition group attacks haven't necessarily increased in number, but they have become increasingly predatory towards civilians. As the military has been asked to not only manage the fight against armed opposition groups, um, but also manage interstate travel and the COVID-19 lockdowns, you've seen a vacuum of power. Um, again, this was part of a military strategy that they were removing people from forward operating bases, military personnel from forward operating bases since uh, about November of last year. But we've seen an escalation of that approach and a, an even further um, reallocation of resources of, of the military, which has allowed these armed opposition groups to um, gain control over vehicle checkpoints, et cetera. But you've also seen the military um, taking advantage of these lockdown measures during the interstate travel bans, even though in theory, these lockdown measures uh, were, were, were firm uh, policies of the government, the military would often take bribes 
uh, and, and hike their prices to enable citizen, civilians to travel from state to state or from city to city. Um, you've also seen a situation of increased sex, sexual exploitation. You've seen an increase in, in um, gender-based violence and, and domestic violence globally, but in this case, we've seen it linked to um, access to assistance. Um, so in this case, uh, the military is, is sexually exploiting women to give them protection, safe passage, access to assistance. And all of these abuses by the military have only deepened uh, tension between military and civilians. And then you have this network of community-based militia groups um, that are like vigilante groups in, in the community that, that rose up in the wake of, of Boko Haram. And in the, with the rise of COVID again, you saw that these groups started to exploit their power, that they, in, in the initial days of the lockdown, they often uh, very forcefully tried to enforce the lockdown. And in particular, you saw them using this power against other youth. So these militia groups are primarily local male youth. Um, and they've gained outsized influence because of um, their, their uh, work on behalf of the community to, um, to fight against these armed opposition groups. But they've also turned that increased status and influence against other youth in the community. And you've seen this being only further, um, further manifested during COVID. Next slide, please. So the third dynamic that I want to discuss is a further erosion of social cohesion um, in, in terms of the relationship between COVID and fragility. You've seen a huge strain on individual and collective resilience in, in the society. One of the main concerns that we heard from community members was that, uh, especially during the initial lockdown, which came around Ramadan and Northeast Nigeria is predominantly Muslim, was that the lockdown was really undermining their ability to participate in cultural and social activities. They weren't able to go to prayers. Um, male youth typically meet in, in these majlisa groups, these informal groups that chat and talk. Um, and these really provide a, a, a social safety net um, in these local communities. But if you have these lockdown measures in place, those uh, very foundational um, elements of community socialization and resilience are at risk of breaking down. Uh, as mentioned, the violence, the, the, the crisis has caused extreme rates of trauma in Northeast Nigeria. And as we know, even in countries where we can comfortably sit in our own homes and have air conditioning and heat and access to you know, water and sanitation, um, there has been an increase in stress and, and, and trauma as a result of this. That's compounded even further. Um, the existing trauma is compounded further when you're in IDP camps or, or in informal settlements across the state. Again, um, another dynamic that we see is this distrust of traditional leaders. Um, I mentioned that already we've seen that traditional leaders often are in Maiduguri, in the capital of Borno State, as opposed to in local communities. COVID has only exacerbated some of those tensions. We've seen examples of traditional leaders um, who if they are seen to be agreeing with the government in these lockdown measures, then they're seen as pandering to political ends rather than fighting on behalf of the local community. And we've also seen situations of traditional leaders who are basically gatekeepers to the aid um, rather than actually facilitating the distribution of assistance to local communities. You've seen a situation of uh, traditional leaders mandating who that assistance can go to, often their own family and friends, or co-opting that COVID aid, main, keeping the PPE for themselves. Finally, you've seen a stigmatization of, of different social groups. 
Um, we've seen cases of, again, youth, there was that pre-existing intergenerational conflict, but because of the aid, uh, because of COVID uh, and the way that aid has been distributed, many youth um, see that the, it's, it's part of their own duty to fight against these traditional leaders. And there have been instances of youth actually stealing the, the aid off trucks um, and that's caused an increase in, in tension in the community. You also have IDPs, internally displaced persons, who are viewed as possible carriers of COVID, um, that they're dirty, they're in close quarters, um, and, and just in general, that they are the primary recipients of aid. There's a perception among the host community already that IDPs um, get most of the aid, which is, is inaccurate, in fact. Um, the majority of aid goes to host communities, but there's still this perception that under COVID, um, IDPs are even further um, getting the lion's share. Uh, there's another case of, of this being extended to, to different ethnic groups as well in one of the communities where Mercy Corps works. The Fulani um, tribe, who are primarily nomadic herders, are seen to be bringing COVID into the, the, the um, sedentary local community. Next slide. Oh, I forgot that little bubble there. Um, if you can go back, forgot that that, yes, humanitarian assistance. So we often see humanitarian assistance as a really positive thing, um, an important contribution, a life-saving um, emergency support to local communities. But I did want to touch on the fact that in the case of uh, it, it can actually exacerbate conflicts. Again, I mentioned how this relates to IDPs, that IDPs are being seen to, to um, monopolize that aid. And again, it, it's, it's causing tensions um, and further fractures between traditional leaders and their, their communities. So um, I just wanted to put that, that button on it, that humanitarian assistance um, can sometimes actually, we talk about conflict sensitive humanitarian assistance. And I think in the case of COVID, it, it's, it's vitally important um, to, to be thinking in, in those terms because uh, humanitarian assistance can often work at cross purposes um, to social cohesion and resilience. All right, next slide. So the last uh, dynamic that, that I'll talk about is the fueling of rumors and misinformation. Uh, in Northeast Nigeria, we had, there was a statistic from one of our partner organizations that consistently sticks in my head that even though they were doing sensitization around COVID, trying to provide factual information about COVID to the community via radio, um, and 96% of their audiences had heard this information, only 45% of their audience actually believed that COVID-19 was real and deadly. Um, so this is obviously a huge gap. And, and when we think about why is this, how can this possibly be that people are getting this information, but they're not believing in it, one of the big reasons for that is again, going back to this inherent mistrust of the messengers themselves. Um, in much of the sensitization work that's being done in Northeast Nigeria, the government and international non-governmental organizations, INGOs, are serving as the primary messengers. And so if there's already a mistrust in government, as we talked about, if there's already this politicization of NGOs, then those being the primary messengers actually serves to undermine the message itself. Um, there's also uh, much more trust in social media than other forms of media. So when you're using newspaper, even radio, um, you're seeing that, that those uh, modalities, those vehicles are, are not in fact the most trusted. So you see this widespread, as a result, you see this widespread proliferation of myths around COVID-19. Um, and, and in the US, I mean, we're not so, uh, we're, we're familiar with some of them. Um, but in Northeast Nigeria, there is this um, continued feeling that until we see it, we can't believe it. So if we don't have concrete evidence that COVID is real, it must just be this government plot 
um, to, to continue to undermine local communities. So it continues to fuel these pre-existing beliefs and conspiracies around the, mal the, the malintent of the government. Um, I'm always careful to bring up this topic, but some of those rumors can serve to fuel extremist narratives as well. Back in April, you saw, um, you saw the head of, of JAS um, make an hour long audio statement about how COVID was just a plague against um, these secular democratic governments. It was, it was God's uh, way of, of, uh, of, of um, responding to their evil um, secular democratic approaches to, to governance. Um, because again, you had the initial lockdown in Borno be right around the time of Ramadan, that seemed to fuel this narrative that, um, that the government itself was perpetuating this war on Islam. Now, while we haven't seen any uptick in uh, recruitment of these groups since COVID started, and again, that's important to, to, to emphasize because a lot of um, CT, CVE people like to, to make this strong linkage, there is still some risk that's, that's there. So now I'll turn it over to Sharon to talk about, um, in response to these dynamics that we're seeing, what, has, what are just a couple of examples of what Mercy Corps has done in response. All right. Thank you so much, Briggs, for that um, extensive information. So firstly, I'd like to say that uh, peace building is an integral and vital in the pandemic period. And um, similarly to what Brice has just said, I'll be taking us through on three major highlights or uh, areas of Mercy Corps peace building programming as it relates to the pandemic. I'll also be sharing examples and workable solutions which were also achieved during this period. So on the first slide, um, the first program highlights is the area of participatory COVID planning. So Mercy Corps has continually engaged community structures, the Good Governance Committee and the Bruno State Task Force in workshops in order to bridge the communication gaps between the government and the community. So for example, for example, there is, there is this hoax, um, there's been complaints from people around COVID-19 being a hoax and the government using it as a way of enriching themselves. Also people not getting um, tested adequately. And then we have, we've seen uh, stigmatization of patients by frontline workers. And so to address this, Mercy Corps is working to establish a grievance redress and complaints mechanism for ongoing communication. The next slide, please. Here. So the second program highlight is the uh, management of conflicts through uh, community-led dialogues. Uh, the community structure responsible for this is the Conflict Management Committee. During the conflict analysis workshop, um, they mapped out conflict issues, which include uh, the traditional leaders, um, the conflict between the traditional leaders and the community. And then they see that the uh, traditional leaders were perceived to hurt COVID palliatives rather than an even distribution in the community. Particularly this happened in Goza LG of Borno State, the Northeast, Eastern Nigeria. Um, in, the, in the traditional leaders community dialogue, participants agreed to establish a distribution committee with representation from different stakeholders to avoid gatekeeping by traditional leaders. So to have some, some sort of equal distribution whenever palliatives or other distribution items come into the, not necessarily COVID palliatives, other distribution items come into the community, there will be equal representation and people who will be able to have these items. So another example, which um, was seen was conflict between market vendors and the community. So these market vendors had 
had increased the price of old stocks, which even escalated into physical violence. So the prices of these old stock commodities were increased just to, just to make profits or just to make high profits. So in the market vendor uh, community dialogue in Damboa area, um, vendors agreed to reduce prices of their stocks when more goods became available. So this very stocks of old, uh, um, uh, the price of old stocks were reduced, were reduced um, when more goods became available, sorry. So another example, again, of a successful dialogue is the IDP host community dialogue, which is the in, uh, internal, internally displaced persons and the host community dialogue in Goza area of Borno State, where the IDPs were faced with uh, stigmatization by the host communities over getting more palliative items. And to resolve this, uh, the communities agreed to joint sensitization and distribution of uh, personal protective equipment to the opposite communities. So, no, can you just go back? Yeah, thanks. So this is the third highlight of our programming, which is the use of dig digitalized meat tracker tool to address rumor conflict. So the use of traditional um, religious leaders who are credible local actors were used actually to, to pre-record messages about COVID facts because um, the community, there's this mis uh, distrust or mistrust with the messengers or with the government and other stakeholders. But you find out that the community have more trust or build more trust to their religious leaders. So how do we get this very uh, the right messages to the people? So Mercy Corps in the programming used this um, religious leaders to pass this message messages across about COVID facts, prevention, and response to counter myths. For example, one of the uh, re recurring myths in communities is that COVID nineteen is not a real disease. So it is a way for politicians. It is a way of politicians to make money. If someone in the community submits this meet to the hotline, they will receive an automated um, automated message in response to explaining that COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a virus. So, and also, uh, what are the main symptoms? This very digitalized system also actually gives, uh, gives you the, the response or the right messages as to, to answering questions concerning this and then uh, and that there is no evidence that this virus is being spread intentionally for political or religious reasons. Rather, it is happening naturally and the spread can be prevented. These are uh, the this, this sort of messages to actually um, define or give the definition that COVID is real. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that our peace building cannot be overemphasized in these times of, of COVID, as it also has to do with behavior change, changing perceptions and attitudes of people. Thank you very much. I'll hang around for questions. So I'll, I'll hand over to Brie to continue with uh, the next uh, presentation. So it's just our last slide. Thanks so much, Sharon, for that really great overview. Um, so just some key takeaways before we turn over to your questions. I'm um, just emphasizing again that public health governance, peace building responses, as much as we'd like to see them as separate sectors, they, they are really intrinsically linked. Um, COVID uh, and weak state society relations conflict are threat multipliers for the public health response as, or rather, sorry, weak state society relations and conflict are threat multipliers in terms of COVID, just as much as COVID is a threat multiplier for um, gov good governance and, and, and peace, uh, or rather conflict and, and weak governance. Um, number two, rather than reducing funding for governance and peace building programming, these sorts of programs should be shored up and uh, they should actually be mainstreaming governance and uh, peace building conflict management programs into public health interventions, which is something we've been advocating for. 
Programming must be participatory. This is my, my favorite kind of anthem as a peace builder uh, is around participatory programming. This has to be from beginning to end, um, starting with community-led analysis, as Sharon mentioned, as a part of our community dialogue work, um, the design of the programming itself to all really capture the nuances and intersectoral nature of the problem, as well as relevant and, and locally viable solutions. Uh, and then finally, programming must consistently embed these spaces for exchange and feedback, um, as we saw in, in two, actually all three of the examples that, that Sharon gave. Um, these spaces are vital to continually build trust, which helps with good governance and peace building. Um, these spaces help to monitor changes in the dynamics themselves and help programmers like Mercy Corps to refine their approaches. So um, we will take any questions that you guys have in these last 15 minutes. Thank you so much. So um, we're now going to go into an audience Q&A. So if everyone can use the Q&A function on Zoom to um, ask your questions. And while people type in their questions, I'd like to ask, um, given the general distrust between the state government and the local communities, um, do you think that people will be receptive to new proposed efforts for increased government citizen communications? Sharon, do you wanna do you wanna answer that? Your thoughts on um, how welcoming people are of opportunities for for governance work? Um, for example, in the in our government community dialogues that we do our to what extent are communities actually receptive to those sorts of activities, if I understood the question correctly. Okay. Okay, please, can you, can you go over the question so I can understand clearly? Um, so the extent to which local community people are receptive to activities around governance if they are so suspicious of, of government to begin with. Um, actually, yes, um, there, is, there is an existing distrust already with the community members and, and, um, and the government. So uh, I don't know if, if this answers your question, if um, the information from the, this government, if the community members are actually receptive, like accepting this very information. So I, I don't know if that's, that's the question. So I guess just um, to build on what Sharon's saying, I think that people, it, it's a complicated question. I remember one of my last interactions with local community members, um, one of our other activities that we were doing before COVID hit was bringing these local government officials down to the community level um, and having them, them interact and having dialogue on different issues around participatory governance. And I spoke with one of these good governance committees um, just before I left and they were appreciative and they felt a desire to continue fighting um, and to continue accessing these government officials but felt very, um, felt quite, um, you know, suspicious that anything would change and, and were quite disheartened um, at the state of affairs. So I guess it's, it's, it's mixed. I think there is a lot of space to continue doing that sort of programming and you have to start somewhere in order to build trust. But um, as fast as it, you know, you, you have to recognize that you're overcoming generations worth of mistrust between government and local communities. So I think, you know, I think it's, it, what communities were saying was that it was an important mechanism, um, but that they, were you know in, until they see real change, um, they they were has they were reticent to to fully invest. Thank you. Um, and this next question is from the Q and A section. So, if you've been so, I think you've been hinting this throughout the entire presentation. But how splintered is the response to COVID nineteen in Nigeria? Who's spearheading the effort and enforcing things like lockdowns? Is it local communities, the military, or outside groups? Yeah, I mean, I think I remember seeing photos from the first weekend of the lockdown in, in Borno 
in the center of town showing like no cars in the roundabouts and only set times for people to go to market, um, that quickly deteriorated. So I, you're not really seeing very strong enforcement of, of lockdown and, and containment measures. And even while the measures were being put in place to some extent in the capital of Maiduguri, again, you have this issue of lack of, you know, it, it, that last mile problem. Um, and in the case of, of Borneo, it's many miles. Um, you, you don't have those, you don't have those systems of government um, at, at the local community level. And so um, you see a total um, corruption of, of government officials, pressure on traditional leaders not to abide by the containment measures and, and lockdowns, um, military officials who will take bribes to let you, you know, go against the, the interstate travel ban. So I think these measures very quickly deteriorated. Um, I haven't been in Nigeria for several months. Sharon, I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, if there's any semblance of lockdown left in, in Borno at this state. Okay, in terms of lockdown, um, there, is no, there is no lockdown in Borno state at the moment. So uh, I think uh, it was just when the first uh, case was recorded in Borno state, we just had like three weeks lockdown, that was it. Um, at the moment, there is no sort of lockdown in uh, Borno state, yes. Yeah, and just to, I was looking at kind of the nuances of the question in, in the in the Q and A, um, and I, I think that INGOs have been the most uh, active in trying to get communities to recognize the seriousness of of the situation, um, but you haven't really had that enforcement coming from um, from you know authorities in the country. Thank you. And for our next question, um, what does accountability look like for funds donated to fight COVID-19? So does the lack of accountability discourage donors from continuing to support both initiatives that are supposed to fight COVID and those dedicated to peace building? So I think a lot of donors were caught off guard when COVID first struck. Um, I know that our programming that um, donors kind of took two different approaches um, or, or even three different approaches to managing those funds. One was to kind of halt any non-essential programming altogether. So one of the programs that we had running was completely stopped for a period of, of a couple months as they kind of figured out what was, what was happening with COVID and how peace building programming could be best implemented in this new context. Um, some donors took the approach of um, kind of trying these middle measures of getting organizations to reshape their, their proposals, still have um, these interventions that were maybe peace building governance or, or whatever the sector was, but just integrate some COVID um, mitigation measures into their existing programming. And then the third approach of donors um, was really to um, release new funds around COVID, which had to be, you know, stood up very, very quickly um, to, to again do this, this uh, very strict uh, public health response. So the accountability around all of these different modalities around rather the second two was a bit complex because the shift was quite fast. Um, so I think it, it, it was challenging. The second part of the question, does lack of accountability discourage donors? Um, I, I don't think that there, I think there's a recognition that COVID is serious enough to continue inv investing. And at this point, donors have been able to make that shift significantly enough and understand uh, the interplay of everything that we were talking about the, around the context and the way that COVID manifests in these societies. So I think that most donors and policy communities remain committed to um, managing both existing programs in different sectors and these new COVID dynamics. Thank you. And for our next question, um, at its height, there were less than 50 COVID-19 deaths in Nigeria. So how has Nigeria escaped the worst of the COVID-19 crisis? or documentation. Sorry, go ahead, Sharon. 
Okay, I think um, Nigeria hasn't done anything differently from what the world is doing. So um, basically, when the first case was reported, we took on the, um, the preventive measures, just like every other country would, or every other country in the world would, uh, wearing of uh, face masks and social distancing, and um, uh, and the rest of uh, the preventive measures. So. Um, even up until now, uh, we still have people who still keep to this um, very preventive measures around COVID-19. So I, I do not think there is something uh, Nigeria particularly has done differently from uh, from the world in actually preventing uh, COVID-19. And to build on what Sharon's saying, I think Nigeria's capacity um, regionally was actually quite strong. Um, a lot of people cited the example of, of Ebola um, and how Nigeria, even though it had something like 15 cases of Ebola, it was able to, to manage that caseload and prevent it from spreading further within the country. So it actually has quite a strong um, uh, epidemic response capacity that in fact other countries around the world didn't necessarily have. Um, the public health system generally is, is not fantastic, especially in areas like uh, Borno State. And again, we're, we're talking about close quarters in IDP camps. Um, my understanding from reports by WHO um, and UNICEF, I believe, um, is that two, um, there are two factors in particular that, that do result in a lower um, incidence rate in Nigeria, and that is the, the huge youth population. Nigeria has one of the youngest populations in the world. So you may actually have a huge number of cases that again, go undocumented because of the very low testing rates um, and, and regimens, but um, there are very few significant, uh, very few severe cases. Um, and just to build on that, a lot of people in Nigeria may not even recognize that it is a severe case because many of the symptoms are so similar to malaria, which people, Sharon's had malaria like 12 times since I've known her. Um, people just get used to living with malaria and typhoid and, and um, I remember being consistently diagnosed with this very generic, the flu, which it wasn't. Um, so people are very used to being sick. Um, so they might not report even severe cases as COVID or even recognize that COVID related deaths are in fact caused by the virus. Um, the second factor that was mentioned um, was the heat. I mean, I, I, we know that COVID um, can still exist in hot weather conditions, um, but when you have conditions that are, you know, 95 plus the majority of the year, at least the, the resilience of the virus on surfaces isn't quite as potent um, as in, in other places in the world. Thank you so much. And for our last question, um, how has COVID-19 affected education in Nigeria? And is there anything Mercy Corps is doing about this? Yeah. Sharon, do you want to speak to that, the closure and the reopening of, of schools? Yeah, yeah. actually, um, Nigeria actually, uh, it affected, the COVID actually affected the educational system in Nigeria. But um, along the line, um, the government resorted to online, virtual online um, schooling for kids, especially for primary school uh, children, um, through, through radio, through radio broadcasts. So there are times where the children should actually um, sit in for this uh, very online classes. Majorly that's what has, has, um, has happened um, during this very pandemic concerning as around as, as relating to education. And again, one of, uh, it's, it actually impacted so much on, on, on the parents, you know, having kids around and not going to school and, you know, 
and some parents feel the disturbance and then some drawbacks uh, in, the, in, in the education of their wards. And again, um, gradually school, the school has resumed and then uh, children have gone back to school. But what uh, uh, the major uh, challenge is kids now do not actually, uh, there's this drawback, the kids are, are not even focused. Um, and then they do not really understand <laughs> the next step again. It's more like, okay, taking them back. I mean, so back like they've never been to school. So uh, this, this, these are the, uh, are the things that the Nigerian government put in place just for, 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 for education. But, uh, but again, I think uh, there was no much impact to that. There was no much impact to that as regards the virtual learning. So, but now the school has resumed just like uh, two months ago. So I think uh, there'll be a great change for the kids, yeah. But I think you also have to recognize that <laughs> that many students have been affected by the last 10 years. Um, one of the, the greatest calls, you know, advocacy points for youth has been to um, build new secondary schools or, or make those secondary schools available again, as you have many of those schools that have actually been taken over by the military in these local government mm -hmm. areas, and, and which uh, is a massive violation. Um, and so I think many of these students, unless they travel, especially in these local areas, unless they travel to places for school, they've been out of, you know, they've, they haven't had opportunities for education for, for nearly a decade now. So um, as Sharon mentioned, you know, radio is the primary modality, um, I, you know, for those of, of you who may have siblings or little cousins, you know that even when you do have great connectivity over the internet and can you know, watch your peers and, and your teachers over Zoom calls like this, that's hard enough to get the attention of, of students. So over radio, there's been a, a massive impact for, for young people over the past year. Um, but that again is just kind of exacerbating a problem that's been in place for at least students in, in Borno and other crisis affected areas in, 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 uh, in Nigeria for the past decade. Sure, thank you so much. And um, to conclude the panel, I'd just like to say that we all really learned a lot and we'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to speak with us today. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely our pleasure. And if there are any other questions or points of interest that, that you guys have, please feel free to, to reach out. We'd be more than pleased to continue to engage. Um, always a part of the IGL family. Thank you. Thank you.